This one has been a big help to me. Amen. I probably said that with the last few teachings. <laughs> but this one is especially helpful if that makes it any different. I would like to talk about exceptions. Exceptions here. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. First of all, no one is an exception to the word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. If we understand from this text, the scripture is the final authority that every man must abide by. That is the rule. That is the general rule. There is absolutely no exceptions to this. Amen? Amen. No exceptions. All scripture is profitable. It's the final authority. That's how every person should live accordingly to their lives. No one is an exception. The tendency with us nowadays is when we hear something from the word of God, we would try to rationalize our way around it and not follow what the Word of God says. The greatest example is the majority of churches today who are not in right doctrine. Because they're not in right doctrine, they'll have contemporary music going on in their churches, they'll have speaking of tongues, and they'll have worldliness all over the place. There are Christians even justifying smoking marijuana, believe it or not. So there are even theologians trying to justify smoking marijuana, drinking alcohol, etc. That's very commonplace now. It's gotten so bad that people will try to justify their way around the Word of God, thinking that they're an exception to the Scriptures. Now, if the Scripture says plainly, do not smoke marijuana, there's no way around it. But I'll tell you the truth people will still try to find exceptions. If you say mankind shall not lie with mankind, do you know how many sodomites are into theology now yeah. and they find their ways around those verses? Sure. In other words, God, God does not care if he has to make it very clear in his word. He believes if a man's heart is right with him, no matter how clear or how vague his word is, if they have the right spirit, they're going to know what he wants, what he intends, what his word says, and they will abide by it. Amen. The reason why there are so many people with wrong doctrines, it's not because the word of God ain't clear enough. It's because their hearts are not right with him. If you say, abstain from all appearance of evil, when we use verses like that, people will still try to justify their way around it with the kind of dressing that you see nowadays in California churches, which is totally immodest, it's totally distracting, and not only that, it'll get some people to sin. And this is from Berkeley too. Even Berkeley, they'll admit that. I remember, like, there's this blog, and I was one of their students. I had to post comments over there, and they were talking about women being uh, uh, mistreated sexually, and then eye candy, and sexualized, and stuff like that. And then one female, I was very surprised. So here's a feminist who typed out, you know, we're very concentrated on the men, but also we got to realize as feminists that women are the problem too because the men wouldn't treat us as sexualized figures if we dress more properly. <laughs> I was so shocked. <laughs> That's a feminist. Here's a feminist who had more sense than Christians nowadays in churches. Okay, so... Bottom line is this, when God gives a verse, whether clear or vague, people's hearts are the final authority. Do you see that? They'll find their ways around the verses. They'll say, well, that's not what the verse really applies in my life. They'll find their ways to justify the way they live, the way they act, and their sins, their fleshly stuff, because they don't go by the word of God. They always try to find an exception around it. And that's a problem nowadays. No one is an exception. We make the Bible our final authority in life. And I'd like to add this. Whatever is more clear, so let's say mm, the evidence weighs more in favor. 
When the evidence weighs more in favor, where God did not say about wearing uh, immoral clothing or certain TV shows or video games. The Bible never told you a list of TV shows, video games to avoid and stuff like that. Never did. But if the Bible says, I made a covenant with mine eyes, I will not look upon a maid. If the Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil, you look up every verse in the Bible about seeing and appearance, why the Bible doesn't have to tell you clearly about immodest dressing or the stuff that you see nowadays on television or the internet. Bible doesn't have to be very clear on that. As much as the verses give way to the evidence, what do you think the scripture prefers you to do with how you see things? with how you dress, with how you act or behave. Now, you know what's going on? The fleshly tendency instinct kicks in, and we justify, we rationalize, we work our way around it, right? But we have to look at the scriptures and see what does the scripture say. And if the scripture says that, it doesn't matter how we feel about it. We have to go by with more what the scripture weighs. Yeah. Amen. If we go by that, then we know what's the right practice, what's the right doctrine, what's the right belief. No one is an exception. The tendency for us to get exceptions is not just our sins with worldliness, but also suffering. When we live our everyday life, we always think that we're the unique person who has to carry this heavy cross unlike other people that no one understands. And that's a very dangerous thought that the devil is going to use on you. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. In other words, those verses point out that it's common to everybody. So you're not the exception. Now, let's take it for granted, your suffering that you're going through, if you were to tell us right here, right now, we're going to feel bad for you because we probably didn't go through it ourselves, and a lot of us will say, I can't imagine what you're feeling right now. Most of the time, people will say that to you. And because of empathy like that, it builds up your justification more that your suffering is more unique. And then that woe is me attitude is more tempting. What you have to understand is your case is not unique just because you compare yourself with 10 people. Just, be care, just because you compare yourself with 1% of the people around the whole world. Now who's that 1% of people around the whole world? King James only dispensational Bible believers. So even if your suffering is unique, which I highly doubt anyway, with every single Bible believing church in the entire world, and you're the only Bible believer that goes through this unique suffering that no one else goes through in any Bible believing church, you're still the unique one in the 1%. If you compare yourself with 99% of people around the world, there's so many people in common like you common problems, common scenarios like you. The danger of exception is to make you not trust and believe the word of God. Did you see the previous problem with people who try to go around verses to justify their worldliness, to justify their sins? It's the same problem. What they do is they do not believe the word of God, what it says. Even if the word of God is not clear, hey, if the word of God gives enough verses that weighs more on what it says, are you going to believe it or not? And your choice to go by fleshly feeling and instinct shows us more who your final authority is and what you believe more. You believe more on your feelings, what you experience, more than on what the verse weighs in its statements. Did that make any sense to you? When we make the word of God our final authority, we believe literally every word it, that it says. We take it so seriously, then it's going to save us from a lot of heartache, a lot of trouble, and a lot of sin. It's going to do that all the time. I mean, 
Isn't it common sense that in the workplace or in school, especially if you're in a higher, higher level of accountability, just because the rules did not say so, and they might be pretty vague on it, it doesn't mean you're not going to take your work seriously. It doesn't mean you're not going to abide by the school rules seriously, especially if your grade is hanging in the balance, especially if your pay is hanging in the balance. I mean, how many people have abided by the syllabus so well in their school, and they thought they abided every single rule and stuff like that, yet they still get a lower grade than they expected? How many people thought that they've done well in their workplace and they didn't break any rule, but then they were in, still in an unfavorable position with their coworkers and with their boss and with the customers they serve? <laughs> you know why? Because it doesn't matter if the rule never told you clearly not to do that. And if you do this, you'll be in more of a favorable position. And if you do this mistake, then you'll be in more of an unfavorable position. No, then the rules are endless. We don't know every, the, there's no written manual. That's going to tell you everything clearly in life. It's your responsibility, your accountability, because you're grown up adults. You're not little children. So you're grown up enough to know how to live your life going by the rules and what the general rule is, even if they don't clearly tell you. You know what that shows me? People take their secular job, their secular school more seriously than the Word of God. And you got a problem with God at the judgment seat of Christ. When He points His finger at you and He says, My Word said this. What are you going to say to God? Well, you, Lord, I know Your Word said that, but, it, you know, and then... It didn't say that clearly. It didn't put it in this context where I'm at. And Lord, this is how I felt, and you should have been more clear. And Come on, man. You say that to your teachers in school. You say that to your bosses at work. You can say that to the judge in court, but I ain't going to jive. I ain't going to jive. They expect that you, you're growing up enough that you have enough seriousness and accountability to know what's right and wrong. The rules are enough. Do you understand? The rules are enough to be laid out where you can discern for yourselves what's right and what's wrong. And stop whining about it. Stop putting the blame game and finding exceptions a way around it. If we live our lives in this manner, believing every word of God by taking it seriously. See that? We believe it to the point that I take it very seriously, that my life is at stake here. My testimony is at stake here. My rewards in the judgment seat of Christ are at stake here. My accountability, my service, one-on-one with God, face-to-face -face at the judgment seat of Christ is at stake here. Can I tell you something? I think that God, He doesn't really have to give as many rules like the book of Leviticus for New Testament Christians then. He knows that you should have enough sense to discern for yourself if you think that way. What does that mean? We don't take God seriously. It's that simple. That's our main problem. People who are more worldly, fleshly, sinful, find their ways around the word of God, who fuss about you Bible believers making a big deal on right doctrine and the Word of God, Word of God, you're bibliolaters, those people have a problem. That means they don't take the Word of God seriously. They don't take God seriously. That's the same thing with suffering then. Do you believe God what He's told you with your temptation, with the sin that you're struggling with, with the trial that you're going through? Do you believe every word what he said to be true, that you can conquer, that you can overcome? Or do you keep saying, but, but, but? You know what you're doing? You don't believe the word of God. You don't take his word seriously. You take your feelings more seriously. You take suffering more seriously. You take your temptations more seriously than the word of God, than his promises. What's your final authority in life? If you do that, you're going to get away from this exception mentality that's very dangerous. What will save you a lot of trouble is not just the Word of God being the final authority. 
That way you don't get into this exception mentality. But also the counsel of good people. That's the reason why the Lord gave pastors. If he thought that the Bible was enough, that's it. He wouldn't have mentioned about a local church. He wouldn't have mentioned pastors. He wouldn't have mentioned from the beginning of the Old Testament in the multitude of counselors there is safety. God still implemented that. And no matter how prideful you are as a Bible believer and you know all truth and you know all that and you know more Bible than the pastor or whatever, a lot of those people who talk like that, especially online, I guarantee they don't really have good, good social relationships in life. They're just losers. Why? Because they don't listen to anybody. That's what it means. They don't listen to anybody. Counsel of good people is so important because you submit under people. You learn to submit. You learn to obey. You learn to put yourself aside. And being willing to recognize what you're wrong on and what somebody else is more right on than you. And if you hardly had that in your life, you got a problem. Counsel of good people are important. That's why God sent you Bible-believing pastors. That's why for children, God gave them parents. That's the reason why, even though wives don't like it, God gave them husbands because they're supposed to lead the family. And even though husbands have so many flaws... And our government has so many flaws, that's why God still gave our current government. <laughs> you might say, why did God give a guy who can't lead and who is going like this? God, why did God give us a leader like that? Because we deserve it. <laughs> it's that simple, you know. You know why? You ever street preach to people and they're like, You preach the word of God at a Bible-believing church, they're like, so you know what? God gave them a leader like, God gave them, as the special song we've heard, a mirror, a reflection of them. Wow. Be a reflection of you. They got their president, they got their leader, because they chose that one rather than the word of God. You see the difference? Yeah. That's the fruit of their leader. That's their reflection, that's their mirror. Now, your life you live in, what are you reflecting? What are you mirroring? This one right here, or the guy that's like, or this community that's always sensitive, that's whining, victim mentality, that can't soldier on for Jesus Christ, very accusatory, very hateful. They don't have the love of Jesus Christ, the love of others, even though they boast it, so hypocritical. Uh, pride, do, we, do you mirror reflect them? A lot of times, uh, when we look at each other, we have to ask ourselves, do we really reflect the people in this community or the Word of God? Okay? We have to think about that. Counsel of good people will rescue you, like I mentioned before, from a lot of problems, as well as the word of God. It prevents you from this exception mentality. People who have an exception mentality will not listen to the word of God, nor will they listen to the counsel of good people. And that shows when you're an exception, you got pride issues. Yes, even during suffering too, you got pride issues. You do, because you're the champion of the one who goes through the most pain. You know, victimization is a problem with this community, and that's your reflection of this community. So, woe is me, woe is that, woe, you know, oh, why is life so hard, it's so hard, and stuff like that. Do you know how many lost people, unbelievers, are in the same boat and struggling to make ends meet? No, not just Bible-believing Christians. In this area, everybody's just uh, scraping at the scraps and just doing what they can to live life. And that is a lot of pride when people think about themselves as the only unique person in pain. That's very dangerous. you got to get out of this exception mentality. These two things are very helpful to get out of the exception. Now, here's, here's a very interesting twist. You ready for this? There's a very interesting twist to this. Understanding that we cannot follow this exception mentality, do you know why people always get into exceptions? Huh. 
It's not like we deliberately mean to. Let me also add that. So what I first talked about is de deliberate intentions, deliberate decisions we make in our lives. We want to stay in exception mentality. But there are also other things out there that causes us to get into the exception, and we have no idea. A lot of times we don't have any control, and we, didn't, we don't realize that those things out there make us fall into the exception mentality. For example, in suffering, let's add this thing. God tests you. When God tests you, do you understand that some of the things that you go through in life, it is true, listen, it is true, you're not the only one with the unique suffering. There's so many people out there, correct? But at the same time, you are unique. You are an exception. Why? Because God chose you out of everybody else for that particular problem to happen in your home for that particular problem to happen to your health, for the devil to attack and tempt your life in this manner. I mean, it's... Uh, how do I say this? We have to realize that not everything in life is going the way without God's control. God is still on the throne. He is still in control. And if he wanted to, if it was his will, he could have stopped some of these problems upon your life, correct? Why didn't he do that? So the atheists, they do have a valid point that you could say that it's not God's fault because God allowed our free choice to choose sin and let sin happen and sin have its course where death and suffering happen to anybody, but still God nevertheless allowed it to happen. That's still under his control and God could have stopped it. How do we explain that? There's no way around it but to realize that God is still on the throne and he let these painful things happen to your life. So when you are in pain, you're going, oh God, why did this bad thing happen to me? When that happens to you, understand that God is testing you. So it's not like you deliberately fell into that, right? It's not like you deliberately fell into that. The Lord let it happen to you. The Lord just happened. Have you ever noticed, uh, as soon as you join this Bible-believing church here, all of a sudden bad stuff started happening, and you're like, why? What? Because God's testing you to see how long you're going to hold out over here. You know why God let these bad things are happening in your life as you attend this church? God is testing you. I don't know why, but that's what God does. And when God does that, he does it for a good reason, to prepare you for something in the end, something better for your life, or because something bad's going to happen and this will be good for you. I don't know. But God is still control, in control, and he knows what he's doing. When that happens, that forces us into an exception mentality without our deliberate decision. I understand that we get on ourselves for being weak. And I know that we feel guilty and we think that we ought to be soldiers of Jesus Christ. But you have to understand that God, he is testing you and he chose you for this unique level of pain that you're going through. And he did that because, as many preachers have said, when you ask yourself, why do I have to carry this cross? And then God asks you in return, well, why not you? Why not you? Because maybe you're the only one that qualifies within your family, within the people around you, where they can see your testimony and you can win them to Jesus Christ. Maybe because you're the one that can give the influence after you win the victory against suffering to help somebody else in this area, and it should be only you. 
Maybe because you gave a prayer request to God. Lord, I want to do something great for you. And the only way to do that is through that particular suffering. Maybe because you prayed for years, Lord, I want that family member to be saved. And the only way they can ever get saved is when you're in pain. Not through a tract, not through all the knowledge of the Bible in the world. So why not you? Why not you? That retreats again to faith in God. Faith in God. There's got to be a strength to that faith. Belief in His Word and in His promise. If we understand that foundation, you'll be okay, correct? Amen. That's good. Okay, now let's get more complicated. Because this will happen if you lose your grounding here. People are going to criticize you. When people criticize you, here's something that's very troubling to you. They have validity in their criticisms. That's what your mind and heart's going to feel and think. When they do that, you start to question yourself the way you live for the Lord, the way that you're doing things. Recall that the general rule is to go by the Bible and the counsel of good people, correct? Now, let me make this more complicated. Let's say that the counsel of good people, and they're good people, they're Bible believers, but they tell you to do something else than what you thought the Lord led upon your heart to do. Once they do that, you hit this area where they criticize you, and then you're in doubt, you're in conflict. And a lot of time what they tell you what to do goes against what the Lord told you what to do. And when that happens, then you, li then you live a life of other sins. Sin gives birth to sin. You get bitter. That's why people still have bitterness bitterness issues uh, with their parents or with their pastors and even Bible believers because they're supposed to be good people and the way they're counseling is even, it sounds very spiritual. But it conflicts with something what the Lord led upon their heart, what the Lord told them to do. And they live in confusion and then bitterness easily bursts out. Fear also kicks in very easily. You wonder with the decisions that you make if God's going to really bless it because you don't know if you're in the wrong because Bible believer so-and-so told you otherwise. A lot of people quit out. Here's one great example. One Bible believing minister did the work that the Lord led upon his heart to do, what the Lord specifically told him to do. But then some other Bible believing minister tells him otherwise because he's older and he knows better and the fruits are evident. The Lord really used him and his ministry. So then this older Bible-believing minister, when he counsels differently from what the Lord told that minister what to do, then he feels like he's inadequate, that he's a failure, that he doesn't know how to follow good counsel, that he doesn't know what God's will is. And he's just a wretch and incapable, so then he quits the ministry. Because all Bible-believing ministers look down on him now. Now, I exaggerate when I say all, you know. So it's not really all, but certain Bible-believing ministers. It even gets them to sin. Why? It causes them to sin because when they're in this conflict, again, this conflict where they're going by what God told them to do, and then there's a criticism, then they try their best to keep serving God, but they keep that conflict, that confusion for years. And what happens is they can't take it anymore. And when people preach about finding joy and peace in God, when you serve Him, that promise is totally untrue to them. And then when they taste sin... They do find peace in that. They do find joy in that. And the world doesn't criticize them on top of that, on what they do. 
So it's so much easier than to go to an apostate watered-down church because they have more of the love of God than Bible-believing churches. It's easy to fall into sin or wickedness because it just relieves the stress and tension out of your life. Why? Because you can't take it anymore. That's the danger when you keep this conflict within you of people who criticize you and then you're trying to do something right for God, but when they criticize you, then you're in confusion. Now, is God the author of confusion or no? No. Did he intend for you to live in confusion for years, yes or no? No. Okay. Go back to the basics. What's our final authority? The Word of God. If the Word of God told you otherwise, who cares what Bible-believing minister so-and-so told you you go by the word of God. Amen. But see, that's the problem. Bible-believing minister so-and-so has a huge reputation of how the Lord used him with a lot of spiritual fruits, one. Number two, that Bible-believing minister was able to use Bible on you. Okay, that's a problem. Then you're in conflict. What are you supposed to do? Well, I got to go by how I feel and... Uh, I'm the exception, and I better uh, just do this because the Lord led upon my heart to do it. No, no, no. That's why you keep that conflict confusion. And you deserve all that problem that happened to you. Because why? It never overthrows the general rule. The Bible is your final authority. And the Bible already gave the rule the counsel of good people. So what are we supposed to do? Then you're wrong and submit. But it ain't that easy, is it? Because why? Bible-believing ministers aren't perfect. Bible believers aren't perfect. Not even your parents are perfect. Do we obey men or do we obey God? We know what the Bible says. We ought to obey God rather than men. That's what the Bible says. If the Bible says that, then we have to follow the Bible and not what men say. And we are supposed to be in peace with that. And finding peace with that, then we will keep pursuing on for the Lord God. Because we saw what the Bible says. But what about the Bible believer who used up verses on me? So I guess that person's right. Well, how do you know the person is wrong? I have a question. How do you not know the person is wrong? What's the only way to show you the person is wrong? What's the only way? <laughs> yeah, it's no-brainer. Scripture. So here's the thing. If there's something else in the Bible that you see from the Scripture that tells you otherwise, and Scripture cannot contradict Scripture, let me repeat that. Right. Scripture cannot contradict Scripture. Then how they're seeing from the Word of God is very different or wrong from how you see the Word of God. Remember, the Word of God should be true to you, not to anybody else. It should be true to you. You don't care what anybody thinks. What did the Lord show you from the Word of God? What did the Holy Spirit show you? In this preaching, it's not like what anybody else thinks of you. What, what is the Lord speaking to you in the preaching, right? I mean, if through the preaching and the Word of God is being preached, why not more so the Word of God itself? So you study the Word of God. You pray to him. You read it. That's what you've got to do. When you start doing that, then you find more peace. What's going to happen is this. What's going to happen then is you're going to find verses in the Bible that you find out, one, you're wrong about, and then you go, oh, now I know why I'm wrong, even though I think it's right, even though I think the Lord told me to do this. I can see what I'm wrong about now. So I'm going to fix it, and I'm going to change, and I'm wrong. Or, as you keep reading the Word of God, you're going to see it differently, and you're going to see Scripture supporting your view, and you're going to go, you know, that Bible believer has good intentions, but that Bible believer is wrong. Because why? That Bible believer is not you in that prayer, in that Bible reading. No, that's your relationship with God, not their relationship with God. What they've confused is their relationship with God with your relationship with God. 
Because Romans 14. Now, for those who keep using the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, they ignore Romans 14 so much. You got to realize that the reason why, can I tell you this? The reason why the Bible is not clear in everything in your decision in life is, again, what's the test factor? What's the test factor? Is it because of God's word? It has to be clear enough? Or is it your heart? See that? Your heart. So your heart, how you see the word of God, God is going to judge you accordingly to that. So if your heart wants to keep, see that, justifying what it wants to do, your own way of doing things, then when you look at the scripture, it's going to turn out that way and it's going to be bad. Or if your heart is, God, I'm honest here. I want to do what's right in this decision, not what my flesh wants. And I'm going to follow the word of God best as I can. Can you show me? Amen, and when you have that, you should not fear what anybody else tells you otherwise with their scripture. Amen. That's why the word of God is not clear on many cases. Because God wants to test everybody how they read the Bible and how their walk with God is like when they read the Bible and memorize scripture and apply it to their life and even apply it to other people. God is testing everybody with that. It's a heart factor. So do you understand now why just because you have right doctrine doesn't mean you're always right? Do you understand that now? Why? Because you might know all the right doctrine in your head, but you don't know how to apply it out of your life or to other people properly. That's a huge problem. That's a huge problem. In Romans chapter 14, we see that Paul is open to places in the Bible where there aren't verses that are clear about it, and everyone has their own spiritual conviction. In verse 4, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or fallen, falleth, yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Do you know what that means? You have no place to judge God's servant, how he's using him, what he's telling him what to do. So do you understand that this is eye-opening? When you're criticizing someone who seems like an exception to you, when you're criticizing somebody, how they're serving God the best way they can, you are criticizing what God told that person what to do. That's a dangerous ground there. Extremely dangerous ground that you want to avoid at all costs. That's a, that's a horrible thing. And I'm going to park that a little bit later on. You got to realize who's your master. And that's when God is testing you. He is testing you when you're being criticized by people. I wonder if your master is your family. I wonder if your master is Bible-believing so-and-so. I wonder if your master is a human name, a human name, a human name. Or is your master me, the Lord Jesus Christ? See, God is testing you. When you face criticism and you're in this conflict, What's going to make you find peace is when you are out of the throne and God is on the throne. If you're literally out of the way, then you shouldn't have fear about what people criticize you on. If you're out of the way and you want to make the word of God your final authority, you want to make God the authority over your life, then you should have peace and you should not care what other people say about you. If we... Look at verse 8, for whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set at not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 12, so then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. We have to realize that we're accountable to God, not to man. So think about this. This is what's going to really help you. What's going to really help you is then if you go by criticisms, what people tell you what to do, then it shows me that you're afraid of people judging you than God judging you. What does that mean? You're scared of the judgment of this world than the judgment seat of Christ. 
Shouldn't the judgment seat of Christ be the number one thing you should be in terror about? Then is it worth it disobeying what God told you to do just because so-and-so told you something else? Just because so-and-so critiqued you? You got to go by what God told you what to do. But remember, that doesn't mean that, oh yeah, God told me this, so I'm going to ignore the counsel of my pastor and stuff like that. That's not what I'm saying. Remember, the general rule, right? But the right foundation. If this conflicts this, then you should be at peace when you go by this. But if you don't have this, that shows how very little you go by the Bible then when you live your life. And don't you think that's dangerous? You go by more so of like how you feel the Holy Spirit is leading you. You know what that is? That's flesh. That's dangerous. You got to go by what does the Word of God told you to do. If you always live your life in a biblically centered life, what's going to happen, and this is so common amongst Bible believers, everyone is not going to agree the same thing on what the Bible says as Bible believers. Do you know that? We all believe in right doctrine. Don't get me wrong. But let's be honest. We're not going to know every detail because God doesn't literally give every detail in the Bible. Remember I said that? God's not, to give, God's not going to give every detail from his verse. And Bible believers will disagree. Some of them will disagree about how long the tribulation years are or how many toenails the Antichrist has. Or when Jesus Christ is going to come, he'll probably come at 2000, 2033 or something like that. I don't know. I mean, when you study that word of God, the Bible's not clear about a lot of things, correct? So obviously when people look at the Bible, they're going to see things differently. When that happens, they've got to go by what the Holy Spirit led them to believe so far. And they cannot implement that or force that on somebody else, what the Holy Spirit led them otherwise. That's a very dangerous thing that Bible believers keep falling into that trap with that criticism. Especially now we come to this problem. Especially when we come to this. Now isn't that amazing? <laughs> Exceptions could be the problem against other exceptions. <laughs> but that doesn't make sense, Pastor. Sure it does. Let me give an example, okay? Here are people criticizing you. When they criticize you, you would think that they would go by a general rule, right? But believe it or not, when people criticize you, they're judging you by their own experience in life, which is unique which is an exception compared to other people. Do you know what I mean by that? What that translates to is we all realize everybody's walk with God is different from each other, right? Unique from each other, correct? Different from each other, correct? Exceptional from each other. Here's the dangerous thing. When people... Go by a life of exceptions different from other people, they automatically assume that because God blessed their exceptional life and God used them, that their walk with God must be right with God, and hence every other brother and sister in Christ must follow exactly the same way you did. So then, if you see some brother and sister in Christ who does things differently from you, and you feel like that, well, that doesn't seem right, and then you speak it verbally to that brother and sister in Christ, and you criticize that brother and sister in Christ, what you've done is you've used your own exceptional, unique, your different experience in life to judge that other exceptional person's life that is different from you. That's exception judging exception. You know who, what the greatest evidence of that is? The lost world today. Did you notice right here, everyone's playing a victim card? Victim mentality? Everybody, do you know why people don't get along with each other even though they boast about love? They all talk about toleration and loving each other, but then they gossip. Right. <laughs> and plus, they don't mean it when they say that they tolerate you, they love you. No, they don't mean that in their heart. 
So believe it or not, it's not just Christian churches that have a gossip problem or a hypocritical problem. It's the lost world. It's everywhere in life. They have that problem. It's because everyone is living by the way they want to live, how they feel, how they think. And they judge everybody else that way. That's a huge, dangerous thing. And the evidence you're going to see that more is when you get married. And the evidence of that is when you learn to pastor a church. The evidence of that is when you raise your own family. And you're going to realize more and more that what you thought you were living by as general rules, it's actually exceptions you were living by. Your own rules, what you thought was right, your own spiritual convictions. But it doesn't fit well with that loving spouse of yours or the family member, especially the church that you're going to pastor. Now, this is incredibly eye-opening because even well-experienced age ministers fall into this trap. Because they see how different Bible-believing ministers run ministries differently from them. And then both sides know a lot of Bible. And the one who goes by a lot of exceptional experience in life, how the Lord raised that minister up in a mighty way, they, it's so easy to judge other people and tell other people what to do, how they do things. Now, you know what that happens? Take this. What that, that's going to be dangerous. What that happens is then you're going to hit that minister hard if that minister is living right for God. Then when you say that to him, and then he's going to go through this conflict, what are you going to be responsible for? That person ending up in these. Do you understand that? Bible-believing ministers have the greatest intentions in the world. So the reason why I'm hard is because I am one. They have the greatest intentions in the world, but they don't realize that what they've done, incredible, permanent, hurtful damage. Extremely serious. You don't want to live your life that way. Now, don't get me wrong. 99% of cases where people leave the church is actually not because of the minister's fault. It's because of their fault. Why? Because don't forget the basic 101. You're not going by this, right? See, you got to do this first. A lot of times when people leave the church or get upset at the minister, they concentrate on the minister's fault rather than what the good counsel they gave or what the word of God showed them. They could care less. So that's very dangerous. That's 99% of the cases. But a 1% case does happen. And when that happens, you better be careful when you critique someone and tell someone what to do. And a greater evidence of that is when you become a parent. Because it doesn't matter how much right or good things you say to them, a couple few bad things or off days that you have, you say to them, they'll remember for life and use it to judge you. So how can we, reject, how can we avoid this ugly mess? It's very simple if both parties are doing their job. See that? If the party is going by the counsel of good people and going by the word of God, and then the other person is humbled to realize that not everybody's spiritual walk is the same as him or her, but only goes by what is biblical, what is right, and is humble, then what's going to happen? Then you're, you're going to work in harmony, no problems whatsoever. But the reason why there's disharmony, and disharmony always happens with one. With one. That's why it's very crucial that everybody gets right with God here. What happens if one side of the party refuses to get right with God? This, you're not going to like this, but you need to hear this. It requires more work and effort on the other party. Can I repeat that again? It requires more work and more effort on the other party. You can't just blame so-and-so. So-and-so's got to work on that. So-and-so's got to get right. No, 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 no. You got to work on yourself. <laughs> you know what's even funny? Even basic psychology, which is so messed up, it's so liberal and extreme, they even get this right. They don't concentrate on the client's other problems or people problem makers. They concentrate on the client. Why? Because the problem is coming from the client. As Bob Jones Sr. said, undoubtedly the problem is you. you. You have to think that way all the time. You always have to think about your problem, and believe it or not, your marriage life will improve, your family life will improve, your church life will improve if you always check yourself and you make the extra effort. 
Well, that's not fair. Well, guess what? Here in this life, it's not fair either, is it, in America? But they do know this. You have to work extra hard if you want a better life. It's just reality, sorry. And if that's how real life works, how much more in the real spiritual life? It requires more work and effort on your part. You can't just keep blaming so-and-so. When, let's get to this case here. So let's say you're the one in the right, and you are the exception in that suffering. You are the exception in the criticism because you're doing something for God and God told you to do something that he didn't tell anybody else to do. Uh, God told Isaiah to eat dung, or is Ezekiel, Ezekiel to eat dung. He told Isaiah to go around naked, but he never told any other prophet that. Now, wh how do you think other prophets, other people saw them? How can they consider them being called by God when somebody is eating dung sandwich and another person is walking around naked? But they had to go specifically by what God told them to do. And even though they're an exception to the general rule of what people are doing, they had to abide by what God told them what to do. That's, good, That's important to understand. A lot of times you're not going to go by the general things in life and suffering, the general things in life and criticism. You're going to be an exception to those things. But never will you be an exception to the word of God as the final authority. Did that make any sense to you? That's why it's important to understand, number one, let's rewind. you got to get rid of that exception mentality, number one. You're just like everybody else. If you get rid of that exception mentality, you're going to find more peace. Number two, you need to accept at times your exceptional case, what God called you to do with this suffering, what God told you to do that will go against contrary to what other people would think is the right thing to do. So you have to accept those things. And again, what does it go back to? Faith. See that? Faith. God's testing your faith when everybody else is criticizing you. I mean, it does hurt, and I get that myself. It does hurt when people think that you're not right with God, and these are Bible believers. And other people seem to believe them more than you. And you look like the isolated one. So it really, really hurts. And that does happen. That's why me as a pastor, I'm very careful... This is the problem with pastors nowadays. Because they've done so much work, so much counseling, they know so much of the Word of God, they know so much about ministries, they assume that they can tell them what to do and critique and have the discernment to do like this all the time when they spit out of their mouths. you got to be careful of that because what you see general cases on telling people what to do, you're going to find an exception there. There are people in there that you told them what to do that cannot go by what you told others. When I go through counseling with people or give advice to people, when I tell them what to do, a lot of times it's general, what I tell other people what to do, but I also recognize their exceptional cases. That's extremely important. If I don't do that, then I'm going to give them wrong advice. And I'm going to be responsible for that person where they're going to undergo the criticism and fear what pastor says. And then they're going to live with this conflict. And then they're going to end up in one of these messes. Does that make any sense? When you become a Bible believer, knowing more of that book, get in charge of the ministry, that's my number one advice. Don't ever do that, okay? Because I've seen the case with too many other Bible-believing ministers. So this is a huge problem, huge problem. You don't want to end up in that mess. Please do not end up in that mess. You know why I can say that? Not because I'm saying that I know better. I know I'm still young and I've got a lot to learn. But one, it's because I have that humble, I have that mentality. I have a lot to learn. I don't know all. 
That's what saved me from a lot of problems, one. Makes me wonder how many ministers think that way. Number two, I do have a very diverse group of people. And I come from two different cultures myself. Actually, it's going to be three, believe it or not, because Koreans are different from Americans who are different from Korean Americans. So I understand this. You don't want to end up in that mess. You better be careful what you say. What you say is remembered for life by people. And they do take it personally. No matter how much they plead the blood, no matter how much they try to move on, they can't. Please, don't end up in that mess. All right, uh, when you're... In the exception here, you got to be very, very careful with that. Exceptions, judging other people's exception. One more thing. You are the exception, right, in the suffering. You are the exception when people criticize you. And you're going strictly by what God told you to do. And you're going to obey it to the letter. That's why you got to be careful. Don't make the mistake later on in life when God blesses you and people look up to you. Don't make the same mistake of where God used your exceptional life where you judge other people's exception. Okay? That's extremely dangerous. Don't do that. You ought to know better because you've been judged by people, critiqued by people before. So how can you do the same mistake that they did? <laughs> You're going to realize you're not an exception after all that. <laughs> Just like every other person, every other person thinking you know it all. You all have a flesh problem, especially yours truly. Here's another thing you want to keep in mind. When you become an exception, remember, what people do in modesty, they're going to do it in excess. It's a really bad case, but I know of uh, Bible believers who left other Bible-believing churches. Now, obviously, that's not general. Very, very rare, very, very exceptional. And other Bible-believing ministers understood and realized that when they left that church, they have good reasons for doing so. Because there's a pride issue nowadays within minister. Just like members have a problem, we have to realize uh, pastors are flesh too, and they have this problem too. That's one thing I've learned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody's got a problem. It's just so messed up. When I started to uh, know more and more about Bible believers, I realized how much uglier and uglier and how much fallible, fallible, and how much weaker, weaker we are. So I have a huge burden for our Bible-believing group. That's why I do whatever I can. I work really hard trying to get people to Bible-believing churches, trying to help them out, that's why I do that a lot with the people here. So, uh, no, I'm not going to say this. But anyway, but the, basically what I can say is a lot of the stuff that I pastor people, a lot of the thing, way that I treat you is because, um, I hope you understand, I don't do this because I'm so smart. I don't do this because uh, I got something great from God that he didn't give to other people. It's because I went through a lot of pain. So I kind of know that's the reason why I counsel, pastor, or do things the way that I do. I do that for a reason. I went through a lot of pain and hurt from other people. If we understand that God put us in an exceptional scenario, remember that people are going to be watching you. From that previous example where I mentioned about people leaving churches, even Bible-believing churches, because there was a genuine problem there. The Bible-believing pastor had a genuine problem and fault, and yeah, even a scandal. It was just something bad. So what happened is that because they left their Bible-believing church, what do you think other people are going to do when they see that? What you're supposed to do in modesty, they do in excess. So then people are going to think that's okay and they're all going to be leaving Bible-believing churches because they find some imperfection or fault with the Bible-believing pastor. Well, remember this. 
maybe the church that you left, the Bible-believing church and the Bible-believing pastor you left, yeah, they have faults, they have imperfections, but their case is not as extreme as that other person who left the Bible-believing church for a very good reason. Don't compare your case with their case. That's extremely dangerous. Uh, a great, I want to publicly say this, that way people don't follow the wrong way how I do it. As you know, uh, I, got, I started the ministry at a very young age. And I, got, I started the ministry without a family. And I started the ministry also, what I'm really known for, obviously, is the internet, right? And I actually went to grad school. Now, do you realize, I don't know how many of you recognize this, but do you realize how that's very contrary to what majority of Bible-believing ministers are doing things? Now, do I recommend that? Absolutely not, no. I do not. But see, uh, the problem is when people look at me, I wonder how many are trying to do the same thing that I'm doing, and they hurt and damage their lives. Now, do you know how much stress that is to me? And I'm still young. I'm just a young person. And I need someone older that I could rely on and someone that I could feel comfort in. So do you know how hard that is for me where I have to do what God called me to do, but at the same time, people who look at me and then they take it the wrong way and they do it in extremity, and how much paranoid I become in my testimony. So if you ever wonder why sometimes I make a big deal about testimony, I'm sorry, it's because of that. So do you know how much conflict I have to live with for years? So I never s confess this, okay? Because I don't believe in a victim mentality or whining. Now, I know of some Bible-believing ministers who do that, and it disgusts me. You better stop that, okay? You ought to be strong, and you ought to take care of your people. I don't like it when they always talk about their trials, suffering that they're going through so that they can win the sympathy and empathy of people and try to get people on their side, especially in a fight or a conflict. I'm sick and tired of that. It is absolutely disgusting, okay? You're no different from a liberal playing a victimization card so that you can get people to side with you, King Saul, and you put up a pity party especially when you hurt and damage other people from doing that. I hate that. I hate that so much, okay? So I never believed in doing that. I get a lot of criticisms online. I get a lot of criticisms from people and even in my own Bible-believing family. But you know what? I don't put a tearful mode in whatever, okay? But this is the first time I'm confessing this. That way people can see where I'm at, and that way they can get more clarity because I'm sure they've been confused. So I no, I do not recommend people to do what I do. I'm not... In, I'm not encouraging people to do that because what God called me was unique. And do you know how many times I thought about quitting? I had to go contrary to what most Bible-believing ministers did. Now, you know what I wanted to do? I wanted to get a full-time job while uh, working hard in the church and serving God. Now, isn't that the ideal way to do it? Yeah. Yeah. If you're a Bible-believing minister, you've got to work at a job where you support your family. You've got to commit yourself to a Bible-believing church. And, yeah, you've got to uh, do what you can to serve God. But God didn't make that simple for me, which was totally unfair. So he, I, the Lord led upon my heart to finish my college and to even hit grad school. Uh, do you know how many uh, different opinions I got from different Bible believers on that? How they looked at me? Do you know how many times I thought about quitting? Because, and do you know how many times I doubted my calling? Now, especially when I took on the internet, do you know how many times that I wanted to shut it down? A lot of people don't understand that. I know what I'm doing is right. Why? Because the Lord showed me too many times, especially people in this church, you, pro you wouldn't have gotten saved. You wouldn't have found Bible-believing truth. You wouldn't have come to this church if you didn't catch me online. So with a lot of people in different Bible-believing churches, and the Lord opened my eyes on that. Lord, call me to this. Why is that? 
Why was my case a little bit unique compared to other pastors? Because before 2020, during that time, this is Silicon Valley. It's a very different culture. So I had people watching online. So they brought me this controversial doctrine, this new stuff online. This is the thing I had to clean up. And then I realized, because dealing with that for two years, I was like, this is getting worse. And I know that other pastors are going to face this because everybody's watching online. So then I realized that I've got to put stuff online so that Bible believers won't encounter this mess with their members and they could probably don't have to do the homework that I did and they can just refer their members to my videos, right? Because I dealt with these type of problems with people in my church. So I had to study, I had to give them answers and stuff like that. And because this was before 2020, and what Bible-believing preacher, local pastor of a Bible-believing church, I didn't say some loser, okay, who's, who only has his house, and that's the only people that he could ever have in his church, or up in the mountain who grows up a beard, and he's lonely doing nothing. No, 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 I'm talking about a local Bible-believing pastor and church right. that does that. See, it's unique in my case. That's why my channel hit big, not because I compromised. It's because I had that unique case that the Lord gave to me. Then when 2020 hit, everybody, every church was using online. Do you think you're going to get hits after that? Of course not. Even my channel slowed down. That's why people's got to understand, if they think Gene Kim's a compromiser or whatever, no, it's not because of that. Because you don't know my life, you've never been in my shoes. So don't tell me what to do. You don't know the pain that I went through and what I had to stomach with. Only, and, only, and only the one in my closest family would understand that. Because I don't believe in conveying that to my people. I believe in being a soldier, a leader, and help them with their pains in life. That's why I understand this. But in my case right here, now people are going excess mode and they're saying, well, Gene Kim does it, or they associate with Gene Kim. No, I have nothing to do with you. Get away from me. You just caused me more hurt by associating yourself with me. Get away from me. I don't like that when uh, people, they become online losers, they ruin their testimony, and then because of that, they put me alongside with them. Get away from me. Nothing to do with that. But do you understand now this paranoia that I have to deal with? I have to deal with this kind of thing nowadays. But why do I stay what I'm doing? Couldn't it be just simpler if I just shut it off? I've learned too much why I can't shut it off. Why? Because my final authority is the Lord, and I go by the word of God. Amen. And I know that you can find verses to try to stop the internet, like a multitude of words there wanteth not sin, Right? And uh, you can say stuff about the internet. You can find a lot of verses on that. But I got my verses too. Okay, I ain't stupid either. And my verse is this. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is what? If I didn't post that vid and that person didn't find Bible-believing truth, did not get saved, didn't find a Bible-believing church, especially one of my people here, who I've seen the fruits and God used in their lives, if I avoided that good thing, am I not held accountable by God for that? Any pastor can agree with that, that what bugs them the most is the cost of a soul in their own church. It's too much of a price to pay. I can't do that. So you know when I'm going to stop? When God tells me. That's it. Amen, brother. And when he slows me down. And guess what? He has. He has. But he grew me too. It's just weird. He's still using me. That's weird. But I know my time will come and I'm not going to last online forever. But I know that this good thing that God gave to me, I got to do as much as I can. That's why I work very hard when I'm doing. With the stuff that I post, with the people here, and even traveling. Because I know that this is only a limited time only. So I'm doing all that I can. So don't tell me what to do. I know what God called me to do. Because I have to give accountability to him. And when I travel, that confirmed more God's will on my life. That I'm doing the right thing. And I believe this too. He'll slow me down when he tells me to slow down. Or he'll even stop it when he tells me. But not you. 
And I don't care who you are. It's God. And when I read the word of God, because I have too much accountability, too much at stake with him. Well, the, there's a little bit of disclosure of your pastor's life. I hope people out there also got a better idea about where I'm at. I know what I'm doing is the right thing. I know. I'm glad I didn't stop graduate school. I, I almost stopped many times, but I'm glad I didn't. I realized that was the gift that God called me, actually. So at the beginning, I wasn't really good at it, actually. Like I told you, my first uh, class was an F. That's hard to believe, right? But see, when I follow what God called me to do, I realize this is what I'm destined to become. And because of that, that's why I'm able to teach the way that I'm teaching, with confidence, teach you the truth, make everybody out there know that what they have is the truth, nothing else out there. And I don't care what scholars throw in their semantics or their new doctrine, guess what? As long as the Lord has me live and breathe, Guess what? You can bring it endlessly even online, but I know too much what God has showed me through graduate school, through the online ministry that I have, and what I traveled and what I dealt with people. And what new doctrine they bring, what new heresy they bring, I wish they'd shut up and shut it off, but that ain't going to happen. You can't just say, Internet, go away, and then pretend that it's going to go away. You can't tell people, hey, it, Internet, go away. You know, that ain't going to work. It's going to be inevitable. Everybody's going to see something there. So I am glad what the Lord called me to do because at least I can combat that and I know what I'm doing when Amen. those things come out. I know what I believe is true. I have all the right doctrines and I can pass that upon the people here and not just the people in my church, but anybody who, will give, uh, who watch us online. And hopefully they got armed. They became more confident with their Bible-believing belief. So I don't intend to stop. I'll do it till Jesus come. I only, he's my commander in chief. I'm going to do what he tells me what to do. Do you also understand that because I realize this excess what people are going to do, how I keep telling people to attend a Bible-believing church? How I keep telling them to submit under a Bible-believing pastor? Why I criticize and kick online at times? Not because, please don't misunderstand me, not because I know there are people out there, especially in persecuted countries, who don't have a Bible-believing church, who are like hours away or who have zero chances. So please don't feel, feel hurt by that. But a lot of people generally online, they're doing, they're doing that, going by online rather than attending a local Bible-believing church. So I don't want them to think in my life that I'm some internet pastor. That mine's an internet church. Absolutely not. I do not believe in that. It's a local church, a local Bible-believing pastor. This is just simply work and stuff that I put on the side so that people can get the truth. And that's the reason why, because I know this excess, I keep going back to modesty. I keep going back to modesty. You know, I know what stuff to post where I can get more views and clicks. I know enough by now. But... A lot of them don't know how many times I held myself back. Do you know why? Because there are times the Lord want me to keep it immodest, and I have to set my priorities straight. Now, there are some stuff that I know works online, and if God gives me the opportunity, I do it, and I do it without apology, and I don't care what other people think or say. But if they think I'm doing that in excess rather than in modesty, they don't know my walk with God. <laughs> Let alone, they didn't even watch all my videos. They just only saw the, the videos or the faults of Gene Kim out of thousands, right? <laughs> Endless videos you find, you're not going to find something to critique on. <laughs> of course you will. So I could care less. I'm going to do what God called me to do. Now, um, out of my life, I believe what I'm teaching here about exceptions and the danger of exceptions and the importance of accepting exceptions. So I hope that this teaching will help you in your life as you go through pain. It's a lot of pain when it comes to exception. A lot of pain will go away with if you go by the first rule, right? Go by that first. And I've always done that, see? When you get to a more complicated area, then remember this, it's always God, what he told you from the word of God. Please do not hit here, all right? I know of some Bible believers who hit here. They're just not known out there. And I know it. There are a good number out there who ended up here 
because they were the exception that the Lord put them in. I do not want that to happen to you. Please do not end up here. Go back serving God and work on your issue again. It's by faith. It's the faith issue. Another thing is this, is that if all of them are spirit-filled people, if all of them are led by God, the Bible believers, they're going to come to understand you eventually. They're going to see God working in your life. So don't think that you're the only one out there. They're going to see that. And not only that, you're going to see also yourself what you need to change and work on. And you're going to realize it's not really blaming them when you're the exception. You're going to find imperfections on your fault on your side too that you'll need to work on. As the Bible says, we all come together in the unity of the Spirit. It's all a working effort. Father God, I pray that today's teaching will help somebody out there. Um, I know that uh, people are going to go through cases in their life, suffering, trial, or criticisms from others, and you're going to call them, you're going to tell them to do something, and they're going to fear, they're going to have second thoughts and doubts because they're always thinking about what other people are thinking. They're always thinking about the general situation, general scenarios. We have to go by the word of God, what you lead upon our hearts through that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.